Oh, Chrissy's there. Oh, no, no, Chrissy's not there. She just made a comment uh, for Triscoll. So hopefully somebody will join us. If you are watching this, and I know I'm actually early, a minute early, so um, live from my living room in the Carrollton neighborhood of New Orleans, um, Facebook Live event. Hey, there she is. There she is. Yes. If you are here, if anybody is here, please like say something, even if it's just like one letter. If you just do thumbs up or a heart, I'm not going to see it. So um, I'm not going to know that you're here. So if you've been here before and you've just done a thumbs up or a heart or an angry face or whatever, um, I didn't know it. <laughs> so Chrissy's here for sure. And so I am going to talk about, I'm going to wait till 730, but I'm going to talk about the uh, old Ursuline convent and the Ursuline nuns and the history of the Ursuline nuns being here. Um, and because this is something that we do on our French Quarter tours. So because of the coronavirus, we're not doing any walking tours. It's not safe to, or we're not even allowed, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's better to stay home and stay safe. And so we've had to come up with new ways of telling the stories that we love about New Orleans. And um, I have really been working to try to figure out how to do this um, Facebook Live kind of thing. And it's been fun. I've been enjoying doing the research and putting the stories together and then telling the stories in this way. And uh, hopefully I'm just going to keep on doing it. And all right, so uh, my name is Libby, and I am a tour guide for a company called Lucky Bean Tours. And um, we, like I said, have not been able to give our tours, so we're telling our, our tours this way. And I wanted to talk about the Ursuline nuns and the old Ursuline convent because it is um, an important building on our tours, almost all of our tours. Hey, Marty! And it's very close to Marty's house. Uh, the old Ursuline convent is uh, someplace that we that we do go on our tours and we talk about it. And uh, I wanted to do it yesterday because it was Mother's Day because I thought about the Ursuline nuns. They are a missionary order and they go out into the wilderness and they do what's ever asked. There's a, they're a French order of nuns and they've been in New Orleans for over 300 years and they educate girls. They believe that their mission is to educate girls. And the way that they used to phrase it, at least, is that they believe that mothers are the first and most important teachers of children. So they believe that it was their uh, mission to educate women at a time when no one educated women. It just, you know, says, oh, what do they need? You know, teach them how to sew, teach them how to cook. Although I really wish I knew how to sew right now. Anyway, uh, so we are going to go ahead and uh, split share screens here. I can do that. Let's see, why am I not able to share my screen? <laughs> All right, well, maybe I'll just tell you about the, uh, the Ursuline nuns. Let's see, is this working? So share my screen. Hmm. Oh, there we go. I think this should be working now. Um, and it's not, okay. <laughs> Bear with me again. I've done this so many times and shared screen. Do we share screen? Um, ah, there we go. Okay, there I am. All right, so we'll actually go back one because um, I skipped over one. And this is how I like to do it me on the bottom and the screen on top. So, yes. Any French Quarter tour, when you walk around the French Quarter, your guide hopefully will explain to you that most of the architecture in the French Quarter is not French. It is Spanish colonial. It looks like this. So this is the very typical um, Spanish colonial with the um, with the balconies and the galleries and the courtyards behind it. And that is because um, during the Spanish colonial period, the whole city of New Orleans burned down. So it burned down when we were a Spanish colony and the Spanish had to rebuild it. It was a 70 year old city that had been established by the French and the Spanish didn't rebuild it in the French style. They rebuilt it in the Spanish style. So you really, really have to look hard to see some French colonial buildings in the French Quarter. And the ones that we point out, there are three that we point to that we say are almost all probably from the French colonial period. The most, the one that probably everyone has seen is Lafitte's Blacksmith Shop, which is a bar on the corner of Bourbon and St. Philip Street. And the, the date of that architecture is not completely known. Like there's 1837, 1860s, 1850s. I mean, excuse me, 17, all of that, all the uh, 18th century, 1700s. 
Um, but uh, it is a great example of briquette entre porto, uh, which means brick in between post construction. So this is this is uh, probably from before the Great Fire of 1788. The other building is Madame John's Legacy, and I'm actually preparing a talk about Madame John's Legacy because it has such great history. It is the French colonial style. It's French West Indies style, they call it sometimes. Mostly, they believe that it was probably heavily damaged in that fire, but not completely destroyed. So we, don't, we do know that the owner of the building made a contract 10 days later. Uh, to have it rebuilt. And I think that the contractor decided to rebuild it in the original style because there were enough elements that they could salvage. So so it's sort of kind of from before the Great Fire. But the one that everybody knows is definitely from before the Great Fire is the old Ursuline convent on the corner of Ursuline and Charter, making it the oldest building in the entire Mississippi Valley. So this is the oldest building, not just in the French Quarter, not just in New Orleans, but in the entire region. And it is no longer a convent, it's a museum. It's a beautiful museum that you can visit. Um, and it is not the first convent that's on that spot. The first convent that was there looked like this. This is, there was no photographs and it was built in 1728. The uh, nuns arrived in 1727 and I think they immediately started building them a convent. It looks similar to the present one because it was built by the Royal Engineers. You know, that the, the king had asked the nuns to come here. Uh, to start a hospital, and soon after they get involved in their original mission of educating girls. But this was the first place, and apparently not very well built. It kind of crumbled to the ground really shortly after. And here are plans for the um, for the second one, the one that is that exists now. And you see in the plans, there's this staircase. So the staircase was apparently the only well-built part of the original convent because it was still there. Even though the convent kind of fell apart around it, the staircase was still there. So the original staircase from the original 1730-ish building is in this one, which was finally, they moved in in 1742. So um, this is the old convent right here. This is what it looked like in those days. And this is what it looks like today. So to back up a little bit and talk about how the Ursuline, uh, the Ursuline nuns got here, we go all the way back to the early French colonial period. So this is a picture of Bienville's, um, excuse me, Iberville's ship. And it's really like the sad, it's, I don't know, remember the French, but it's like the sad, faded, dangerous voyage of Iberville. And Iberville and his brother Bienville were the French, uh, Frenchmen who finally came to Louisiana and claimed it for the French. So La Salle claimed it for the French back in 1682. Iberville and Bienville arrive in 1699 and start colonizing the area. So this is the time when the French start colonizing the area, mainly around uh, the Gulf Coast, like Biloxi, Bay St. Louis, uh, Mobile, Alabama, are all older than New Orleans. And they're really living a kind of primitive existence, you know, and they're, they're living close to the river and these sort of little huts that they, they hobbled together. I mean, there were no women. The French didn't bring any, obviously there were native women here, but the French didn't bring any women. It was pretty much all soldiers. Um, and in 1718, the city of New Orleans was established. So here it is, La Nouvelle Orléans, the city of New Orleans. Oh. Carl is there again. Yes, it is a beautiful building. I love it. And it's definitely worth visiting uh, when you come here. And one of the best things about coming here and visiting it is that you get to go in that back uh, into the, the chapel that's right next door. And the chapel's just gorgeous. So here's a great little picture. And you'll notice that along the bottom, Fleuve Saint-Louis. So it's still, they're resisting calling it the Mississippi. Mississippi was the native word. And as you can guess, the French didn't come in and be like, oh, let's just respect their words and call it what they would call it. They tried and tried to call it all these French names, but it's stuck. Mississippi it is. But they're still at this point, uh, this is, I think, drawn up uh, 1728, and they're still at this point trying to call it something else. Um, so the city is established in 1718. The following year, the French start bringing in slave people here from Africa. So basically, we have French men, soldiers, pirates, um, people that were seeking their fortune one way or other, trappers, a lot of fur trappers and fur traders, uh, kind of rough bunch. And uh, the native natives with and lots of alligators here, 
um, and snakes and mosquitoes. And it was not that pleasant a place to be. And then of course the enslaved Africans because the French began bringing enslaved African people here the year after the city was established. Um, and their plan had been to have all of these massive tobacco plantations. So the French had grown completely dependent on British tobacco. They're all like smoking the British tobacco. And they're like, man, we gotta grow our own tobacco. Like this is gonna save us a lot of money. The British are really charging us an arm and a leg and we just can't stop. So we're gonna have these vast tobacco plantations like the British have, like in the Chesapeake Bay area. Turns out you can't really grow good tobacco here. Nobody apparently tested the soil in advance. It wasn't working out. So instead of what they planned was for New Orleans to be this sort of like little business hub surrounded by these tobacco plantations. All the enslaved people would be on the plantations. This would just kind of be where people do business. It ended up that everybody ends up in the town. So we have this motley assortment of people with not a lot of income and a lot of time on their hands. And so things are getting kind of rough. And there's also a serious shortage, according to the Frenchmen, of French women. They needed women. They were like, dear France, send us some women. We got to start making some babies, French babies up in here. We got to turn this place, you know, into a proper French colony. So this, the king of France, who is Louis the 15th at this point, Louis the 15th says, okay, we're going to get you some women. We happen to have some women that we would kind of like to get rid of anyway. So let's just send them to, you know, the swamp. Uh, and so they rounded up these women in Paris. And here's a famous picture of the rounding up of the prostitutes and loose women uh, of Paris, putting them in these big um, like carts where they're going through the town and people are yelling at them and stuff. And they're gonna be taking them to the prison or insane asylum. And instead the king's like, hey, I found a way to get, you know, make some room in these insane asylums and prisons. Let's send them to Louisiana. So um, several ships of these like correction girls went to Louisiana and Canada and probably to Saint-Domingue, which I've never actually heard that story, but I imagine they did there too. Um, and uh, they were, they were uh, brought to Louisiana to kind of populate the colony. And here's another picture. It is the, um, and I have to put on my glasses, excuse me. Uh, I'm trying to think the title of it is um, Depart pour les Îles. So yeah, going to the island. So the, this group was probably headed to uh, Saint-Domingue, but this is my favorite one. I love this picture because the writer, the, the person, the illustrator of this is not saying like, let's get rid of these women. It's, they're like sad, sad day when all the prostitutes left Paris. And it's called in English, the sad embarkation of the joy girls of Paris. Um, and he even names them. There's like, there's uh, Kate the blonde and Margot the brunette. Uh, sending all the crazy women. That's right. Makes perfect sense. That's right, Chrissy. That's what we're all trickling down from here in New Orleans. So in other places when they say, oh, my ancestors were among the original settlers, it means something totally different when it's in New Orleans. So yeah, so they rounded up these women and they sent them to New Orleans. And very often they would brand them with a cattle branding iron because they were they were wards of the state they were inmates in the asylum and they're like we can't just let them run around we gotta you know let everybody know um warning you know crazy girl or whatever and so they would usually brand them with the fleur de lis so the fleur de lis is our symbol of of new orleans and the saints and uh, you know so many things in New Orleans, and we love the fleur de lis. But at that time, it was like branded into the skin of a lot of people that were sent here, and enslaved people and male prisoners as well. So uh, anyway, it's getting messy, right? Things are crazy. And this is uh, Gerard de Val de Terre wrote in 1726. He sends this word back to France. They like go to France. He was supposed to be the commander of Dauphin Island. And, and I mean, my God, it was crazy here. So he writes back, in short, this is a country which to the shame of France, be it said, is without religion, without justice, without discipline, without order and without police. Yes, that's the New Orleans we all love. But at the time they were like, okay, this can't work. So King has to put on his thinking cap again and figure out another plan for lending some respectability to this French colony. So this is his plan. What else classes up a joint better than a bunch of nuns? So we're gonna get a bunch of nuns here. They put in an order for 12 nuns 
uh, Ursuline nuns. I think that their original uh, pick was the Gray Sisters, who are a medical order, like they are known to open hospitals. Uh, second choice, the Ursulines, who are a missionary order, and despite the fact that they're for, that their mission is to educate women, uh, they uh, do whatever's asked of them. So they go into the wilderness to open this hospital in New Orleans. And uh, this is a, a clearer picture of the same one. And what we're looking at here is a lot of symbolism. We have a lot of things and they're approaching and they've come and come home and we have the priest, they're working for the priest and the missionaries. But what we definitely have here is we have a girl with this basket who I think is supposed to be what the next wave of women that came through, which were the casket girls, maybe, or at least a girl of a lower station and then a layer, lady of a higher order an enslaved woman over here with a baby, a native woman over here, because the Ursulines took pride in the fact that they didn't just educate French girls, they educated all the girls. All you had to do was be a girl and the Ursulines would educate you. So that was something they really took pride in. Um, and so, so the nuns get firmly established and then the French send the next wave of girls over, which are the, the casket girl or the fille à cassette. And casket or cassette, was a uh, the box that they use. Now, I have a hard time believing that they fit all their possessions into something this small. And also, like sometimes at night on the ghost tours, they'll insinuate that they were the size of coffins. I think they were just regular trunks. But either way, the girls kind of stood out because these were poor girls. They decided, we can't get some like girl from a good family to go to this swampy, alligators, mosquitoes, yellow fever in the middle of nowhere, leave your family and go to this horrible place. But we're going to get these girls that are virtuous because the nuns can vouch for them. They're mostly orphans. They were like little girls who have been orphaned at a young age and sent to live with the nuns. And they had grown up with the nuns and they could cook and they could sew and they could pray and they were good and they were virtuous. They were virgins. The nuns could vouch for them. And so that was the plan. Get these girls, give them a little bride starter kit, like a trunk that they could put like some linens and some pots and pans and some, uh, a Bible and, you know, like a, a wife starter kit and send them to New Orleans. And these were the fee a cassette, the casket girls that come to New Orleans, um, in about 1728. So just about a year after the nuns, I, part of the reason of putting the nuns here was to have a place for the girls to stay with um a, a, a you know decent good place for the girls to stay until they could um arrange for marriages for them so this is a huge wave of females coming into louisiana french women coming into louisiana uh this is where some of the tours at night kind of start saying that maybe they were vampires i think we'll save that for another uh another live event uh, talk about vampires in new orleans and then this is um, this is the casket girls' wax figurines from our wax museum, which was closed down a couple of years ago. But this was this was this was depicted. We had stories from our from our past. Anyway, so the, among the nuns that came here, the twelve nuns that came here, there was one uh, novice who had not yet taken her final vows, and her ne her name was Marie Madeleine Hachard. And she wrote um, five really long letters back to her father in France in 1727 about her journey here and the early days being in New Orleans. And this is really one of the best accounts of early life in New Orleans, because every other account is written by some guy, some number cruncher that the king or whatever sent here, say like report back on how the colonies, and they would say like 73 men are employed in building the new hospital and we use, we felled 400 trees in June. Like it was very, very, it gives us a wonderful glimpse into what was life here and how the city was built, but it's not so personal. But this is a 19 year old girl writing letters, an adventurous girl writing letters to her dad and like, they're so sweet. And she talks about what they ate and the plants that they grew and the games the children played and what the women wore and the scandals of the town. And she tells this great story. So it's a, it's a 
I think four and a half month journey across the ocean and it is rough. They are circled by pirates. Uh, some of the lay women on board because the nuns didn't do it, but the women had to dress as men to appear to the pirates that they had more crew than they actually had. And it worked and they all were like, yay, the pirates went away. Um, they're in a storm, people are dying. Uh, and then they arrive at this island that's off the coast of Mississippi, about five miles off the coast. They're very, very close, but it's this sandy island. And the ship gets mired in about five feet of, of sand and they're stuck. And of course, there's rumors. They believe that this island is inhabited by savages who not only eat white people, but force them to kind of drink their own blood before they kill them and eat them. So this is like like running out of gas in a bad neighborhood. So they're freaking out. Oh my God, I can hear the drums. And so they're scared and they start trying to put stuff off of the ship to get the ship up and float it and buoyant. So first thing they do is the cannons. Their idea was to kind of put some wood down there and float the cannons. Turns out cannons don't float. They sunk into the ground. They're still not up. So they start throwing their ballast, these rocks and stones and, and iron and, and metals and stuff into the ocean to kind of get back up. And they're still not up. So they're like freaking out. Oh my God, we got to get out of here. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And the captain says that the sugar has to be thrown over. And this was like making people cry, right? Because this is before we started growing sugar. It was the colony's entire uh, supply of sugar probably for the year. And um, they throw it in and they're still not up. And then finally the captain makes the horrible, sad decision to throw 61 barrels of French wine into the ocean and waited until nightfall so no one had to bear witness to this sad, sad moment. So they were all crying about the fact that uh, they were throwing the wine and the sugar in. But it, we make jokes about how, yo, New Orleans, we love to drink and the booze was the last thing to go. But it also talks about how important it was to have those good moments. And that's the root of New Orleans. Like life is hard. And so you need sugar and you need wine and you need those good things. That's as important a part of life as, you know, your cannons and your, and your ammunition. So anyway, that's one of the many stories. If you get a chance, read this book. It's great. Um, so they uh, end up at the Ursuline Convent, and eventually this is the one that was built, and that's the one that stands today. So then there was the fire 1788, which we talked about a little while ago, and this is why the Ursuline Convent is one of few, very, very few French um, uh, archi French structures. And that is because the this the, the convent didn't burn down uh, during the during the fire. According to legend, and whenever our tour guide says, according to legend, you have to be careful because, but the story that the Ursulines say, and it's on their website, is that it was saved by the quick thinking of like the oldest, frailest old nun, Sister Felicity. And when they describe her, they're like Sister Felicity of the Hunchback and the Palsy. So this is this ancient, old, shaky woman that nobody even remembered was there probably. And this fire, they're freaking out. They're a cloistered order. They're going to have to run out into the street. Oh my God, it's burning down. And so they're screaming and everything. And she comes downstairs. And she said, now what's going on here? And they said, oh, it's in the Felicity, the whole city is burning. And it's pretty soon the convent's going to burn. What are we going to do? And she says, I know exactly what to do. So she goes upstairs and she gets her little statue. And, and this is, it's still here in New Orleans. It's called Sweetheart. And so you can see she's only like 12 inches high. She's up, that's her in her case. So she's a tiny little statue that Sister Felicity had pulled off a trash heap when she was leaving France and brought it with her to New Orleans and she would kiss it and clean it. And it's got like crooked eye and everything. And, and she's like, this is what we need. So she takes her little statue and she starts climbing up the stairs, up, going upstairs during a fire. They're all like, what do we do? And she shakily puts her little hand in the window and all witnesses present said this huge wall of flame was coming their way. And as soon as Sister Felicity put that statue of Our Lady of Prompt Succor, which is their favorite version of the Virgin Mary, there she is, those flames just turn around and went the other way and they were like, yay! <laughs> so it was a grand moment for the nuns and for Sister Felicity, who was like the hero employee of the month. Um, and so she she was the one, she's, like I said, uh, Our Lady of Prompt Succor, S-U-C-C-O-R, is the uh, favorite version of the Virgin uh, of the Virgin Mary of the Ursuline nuns. 
And so then when we were fighting in the Battle of New Orleans in 1812, Andrew Jackson asked the sisters to pray for an American victory. And the mother superior and all the sisters were praying all night long in the chapel, which is this gorgeous chapel that you can visit today. They're praying all night long. And she says, if they win, if the Americans win, we will do a commemorative mass every January 8th for as long as we can. And they still do to this day. Uh, because, of course, the Americans were victorious. So this is a mural that's in the kind of the parking lot of, uh, of the, of the um, convent. And it says, um, let's see. <laughs> oh, Almanester Chapel, 1786. So the chapel was donated by Don Andreas Almanester y Rosas, who was a, really uh, an important philanthropist in New Orleans. Our Lady of, of Prompt Sucker across the top. Battle of New Orleans, 1815 on the right. And then across the bottom, the fire of 1812. And I think that's just an error. It was actually the fire of 1788. They got it mixed up with the Battle of New Orleans, which is the War of 1812. But I looked and I looked and there's really no, uh, there was no great New Orleans fire of, of 1812. Um, and so here are the nuns coming to Louisiana, Our Lady of Prompt Sucker, the star, and then the battle right here. So that's a mural in there. All right, so um, anyway, they continue to stay at that location. Uh, not much longer after that, in the 1820s, the city was growing. We were become a very wealthy city and they were cutting roads through their property, which is down there. And so they decided to move and they moved downriver to what we call the Lower Ninth Ward today, um, uh, which was um, you know the rural, rural area, the country, and they had farmland and stuff. And here's a picture of the... Uh, the Ursuline Convent in New Orleans. And so that right there is the Mississippi River. And this was their convent. They were right, right, right on the river. And here's another picture of it. Um, the This is the levee. So this is the levee that was being built up to protect them. And this is the nuns walking around in their little property with their, you know, with their convent and their gardens and everything. And then around 1815, um, they start digging the industrial canal, the industrial canal that cuts through New Orleans today and divides the lower ninth ward into what was the ninth ward, the vast ninth ward into what we call the upper ninth ward and the lower ninth ward now. Um, anyway, and so that is right where the nuns had their convent. So the city paid them uh, half a million dollars and knocked down their convent. And in 1912, 52 nuns got on a streetcar that, and you can see that the streetcar is marked um, private, you know, they got their very own streetcar and they left their home in the Lower Ninth Ward and they went all the way uptown to Claiborne and Nashville, where they are now. And this is the Ursuline Academy. Uh, it's a school where they still teach girls to this day and live up there. And they also have the National Shrine to Our Lady of Prompt Succor because Our Lady of Prompt Succor, and she's the one that the Catholics pray to around here during hurricane season all the time. She is also the patron saint of New Orleans. And this is the inside of that church. It's a really beautiful church. And they have a golden statue of Our Lady of Prompt Succor up here. Here's a close up. Here's another close up. And that's also where they have Sweetheart on display. So you can go up and see poor little Sweetheart, this little beaten up old statue. And they still educate girls. It is the oldest Catholic school in the United States. Uh, this is the class of 2017. Very traditional. They're all wearing their long white gowns and they have their red roses. So, you know, in the beginning, I always kind of joke that they said, no, we educate all girls, uh, white girls, French girls, rich girls, poor girls. Uh, African enslaved girls, native girls, um, but uh, now they educate all girls whose parents can afford to send them to the Ursuline Academy because it's it's a it's a pretty fan, pretty pretty good school, expensive school. And then this is kind of a bird's eye view of the Ursuline uh, old Ursuline convent, which is a museum today, and this is how it looks. Um, you can you pay right there at the at the carriage house, and you can walk around the grounds. It's a self guided tour. You can go into the church. I like also this side over here, you can see this row of buildings. There's the Mississippi River. And then you also see this construction of those uh, exterior buildings behind it. I always like that kind of little row of buildings there. And then, um, so this is like every year you'll see the, um, the little girls, the second graders taking a tour of the French Quarter and they'll always go to the old Ursuline convent and learn the history of the Ursuline nuns and the Ursuline Academy. 
Oh, you have an Ursuline Academy near us, girls, middle and high school. So cool to know this history behind it. Thank you, Carla. I think it's cool too. And on my tours, very often I meet, um, I meet people that have gone to Ursuline Academy schools all over the world. Uh, the nuns, like I said, they were missionary orders, so they were able to go just about anywhere. And um, they're 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 pretty good schools. So uh, that's good to know. All right, let me just close this one. There we go, just me. Anyway, thank you, Chrissy, Marty, and Carla for sure, and whoever else is out there. Um, thanks for tuning in and listening. Hopefully we can do a couple of more of these. And I'm going to try to figure out the logistics of inviting someone to be kind of like a guest on here and tell us, because uh, there's a lot of people that know a lot of stuff about New Orleans much better than I do. These are kind of the tour guide version of these, not the deep historian versions, but the uh, versions, but the, the tour guide versions. Oh, yay. Hey, Pam. Hey, Loretta. Yay. We got some tour guides on here. Oh, any tour guide that wants to figure out how to do this, please contact me because it's actually easy to do, but it's hard to figure out how to do it. Roni, all right, everybody. All right, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I would like, in fact, specifically to get Roni on here to tell us, he's been doing a lot of research. He does the Jewish history tours and he's been studying some history of sports in, in New Orleans. So uh, that would be really fun. Thanks, Gary. All right, y'all, everybody, have a good one. Uh, drop us a line on the Lucky Bean Tours Facebook page and let us know anything else that you would like to hear about. Thanks, Carla. Your Carla is my repeat customer. She's the best. All right, y'all. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day, belated.